Hi, and welcome to the Kaufman Connect. I'm your host, Fire Chief Scott Prytag, and with me today, finally, we get to catch up with Firefighter Josh Redfern. Josh, how are you? Good, Chief. How are you? You know, and what most people probably don't know yet is that you are, in fact, already a star. I don't know about that. Uh, so we have our, our second promotional video promoting uh, CAFMA as a good place to work. And you're in it. And so I got to watch that. Uh, our former HR manager, Patty Brookins, when she sent that to me last week, she's like, oh, my God, what happened to Redfern's hair? Yeah. So you were going for the mullet look, and I guess it didn't work out. Yeah, it didn't work out. Got to be too much work. Uh, you can thank Captain Travis Smith for that. It was a direct order from my supervisor, and had to be followed. To clean it up a little bit? Yep. No, to grow the mullet. To grow the mullet? Yep. Okay. I, You know, they weren't good in the 80s uh, or the 90s, and they're, they're not really good. Some people could pull it off. Uh, MacGyver. Mm -hmm. MacGyver. Joe yeah. Elliott, Def Leppard. He did well with it. Jake had Bronk. time. Sorry, Jake. It doesn't work on you at all, but stick with it. So uh, this is another episode where we get to showcase one of our newer employees. I know you've been here for a, a few years now, but we just, we, people actually watch or listen when we bring some of our, our folks in and introduce them to the public. And so I talked to you about this months ago and it's since then you were moved from station 53 to some other places. Mm -hmm. And so we had trouble catching up and, just so happens you're on overtime today, so you're actually getting paid better money to be here and do this with me. Yeah, stars in line for today. I know, this is perfect. <laughs> so uh, let's start with, Josh, where'd you grow up? Well, I grew up in Chino Valley. Um, I graduated in 2015, so I might make some people out there feel a little old. Um, played baseball throughout my whole childhood. After I graduated, I went to Chandler Gilbert Community College. Okay. Um, got the opportunity to play baseball down there for the fall semester. Um, turned out wasn't for me. Realized that heart wasn't in it anymore. Skill okay. wasn't there. So made the decision to quit, come back to the Chino Valley area. Um, not really sure how I got into EMS. Just okay. kind of sounded cool. Uh, signed up for the course. Um, got on with a private ambulance company. Shortly after that, uh, father got sick, moved back home, um, helped take care of him and the family. Um, then I got hired by Grand Canyon South Rim Fire. Okay. So I worked there for about nine or 10 months or so. Um, and then just continuously tried to test here and stars align, got the offer. Um, then I moved to Prescott Valley, lived with my beautiful wife, Megan. Um, been, Oh wow! One year's coming up this month, so yeah, it's going yeah, something going you better fast. remember. Yeah. Your first anniversary. Oh, I remember. I probably, if she's watching this, I promise. Right. I remember. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, that's kind of just a quick gist of it. So you, you said you don't know what got you into EMS. What got you interested in the fire side of things? Do you think? Um, I kind of saw my dad not enjoying what he did for work, okay. you know, doing the same thing over and over. And I always told myself I wouldn't let that happen to me. Um, my uncle was actually a captain for Phoenix okay. uh, back in the 90s. Um, he was like, yeah, maybe check this out, see how you like it. It sounded cool. You know, I didn't have any um, life-changing experience with the fire department when I was growing up, but just sounded like a cool job. Read into it more, got into the 1 and 2 Academy and just took off from there. It's just been a... Awesome choice. Now, did you get hired the first time you tested here? No, no. No, it took took about two years. Okay. Yeah. All right. And the first time, did you get to the chief's interview or was that the second time around? Uh, second time around. Second time. Yeah. Okay. Um, because I know in your chief's interview, you did excellent. Oh, you, you did you. really well. And so we knew we wanted to hire you before you left the room. Appreciate and that. I, I, from my perspective, um, I haven't been disappointed at all in having you here. As a matter of fact, I think uh, you bring a lot to the table for the future of the organization. And oh, thank you, Chief. That's what that's what we're excited about is we're really trying to hire for character. And we can teach skill. And I think you see that and, and you're a model of that. Now you had skill coming in, but you also had the character which we find more important. Yeah, I chalk that up to my parents. Definitely. Um just had an amazing childhood. Um, anything I ever needed, my parents were there to, to help me see it through. Um, and uh, 
I think with my dad passing away, that kind of just set in stone, you know, fork in the road. I could have gone down a bad path or a good path. Right. I know my dad wouldn't want me to go down the good path. So that's what I did. And uh, now I'm sitting here today talking to you. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. So is your wife in EMS as well? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. She works part time for a private ambulance company. Okay. Um, And then she also does some uh, esthetician uh, work. Um, similar to what Chief Abel's wife does. Okay. Um, a couple, gotcha. couple wives do that kind of stuff. So she just does that part time and she enjoys it. Awesome. And, you know, we know there's a private ambulance company up here and mm-hmm. the people on the street really do an excellent job. Oh, absolutely. For us. Um, they're, as we've said before, they're hampered by their corporate. Um, but I'm not saying this publicly, but there's going to be new opportunities in the very near future. Mm hmm. Uh, for people who are seeking them. So yeah, pretty she's, excited about she's that. She's been made aware. <laughs> Excellent. So what is it or what, what drew you to CAFMA? Is it because you grew up in, in Chino, so this was area, it's kind of a hometown fire department, or um, did you know a lot of people here that you, you had friends and wanted to work here? What was it that drew you to us? It was kind of a mixture of both, really. Um, getting to stay local, um, was huge for me just because my whole family's here. Mm-hmm. Um, I also grew up knowing quite a few people, um, Ren Douglas, um, Danny Parker, who retired, you know, some years ago. Well, if I would have known you knew Ren and used him as a reference, mm-hmm. I, I might not be very sitting different. here. <laughs> and I always say that because we're close friends. Yeah. No, Ren's, Ren's awesome. Um, also, yeah, Danny Parker, I mm-hmm. uh, got to sit down and talk with them. Um, when I first started getting into this and they had nothing but great things to say about working in, in this area and for this organization. Um, I just, I couldn't, I just felt kind of like an outsider testing for other departments, but when I tested here, it felt like it was kind of meant to be, might sound a little corny, but it felt like the right decision and, and the right organization to work for. Very good. Do you still feel that way or? Oh, absolutely. You, it, absolutely. I mean, you're sitting across from me. So, of yeah. course, your answer is going to be canned. Well, absolutely. Absolutely. Chief. But, you know, it's it, we try to create an environment and, and not just senior staff. You all in the stations need to create that environment that's welcoming to other people, that, that draws other folks to want to apply to this organization. Sure. And as we look to the future, and we know there's going to be challenges with recruitment, hiring, and then uh, retention, just because we, we're we kind of like an island. I mean, yeah. You grew up up here. You, you know, um, if you're in the valley, there's resources and people everywhere. But if you're up here, you have Prescott, you have Kaufman, and then you have a few smaller agencies. So, And you have a housing market that is absolutely out of control. Yeah. And that's going to create some challenges. So... As we look to the future, I think we really have to set ourselves up as a positive culture that uh, and a, a place that people want to work in because it's a place where they feel valued mm-hmm. as members. And that's that's exactly how I feel um, compared to past jobs. I just feel like, like you said, a family member mm-hmm. here. Um, everything you said, you hit it on the head. I mean, everything's through the roof now, cost of living. Um, It's just kind of a tough time. Got to see it through and push through. Um, It is frustrating just as a young, young firefighter. Um, But I know it's not permanent and it's just a, just a tough spot that we just got to push through. Well, and and when we look at where we are today as a country with the economy, um, Chief Tharp and I sat through a webinar put together by the Western Fire Chiefs Association yesterday, and it was with an economist. And so he was talking to us about where we've been, where we are currently, and where he sees us going in the future. And as he said, the great thing about being an economist is kind of like being a weather person. You don't have to be right. You just have to make a good guess yeah, and have it sound reasonable. So he said, I'll give you my prediction. He said, the fact of the matter is nobody holds me accountable if I'm wrong. But... What the trends are showing is that, uh, one, the, the inflation could have been headed off by the Federal Reserve, but they kept calling it transient. Clearly, it wasn't, and they should have known that. 
Um, but because of supply and demand, supply issues, demand being up, supplies aren't here, uh, and inflation, he says there's about 80% chance that we're going to see a recession in 2023. And I put that out there just because when we look at this, is you're a young firefighter working and building your career with your young family, and where I am looking at retirement in eight and a half years, what do we do to bridge this gap? How, how do we get through it with the limitations that we have on funding for fire districts? And it's, it's a challenge. And when what I'm hearing for, from some that are in the home buying market is that if you're not coming in with an all cash offer above asking with no contingencies and, and no loan to deal with, then you're not considered. Yeah. Good luck. And it's just, it's just wrong. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I know what the market is. Everybody believes in the free market. The market needs to correct and that could take the recession to correct it. But how much damage is going to be done during that time? I, I don't know. That's tough to tell. Um, and then he thinks that the supply chain issues will catch up by 2024. And that could be a result of recession in 2023, which drives down demand. Because I don't know about you, but I think before I get my diesel and drive somewhere. Oh, man. It's tough. Yep, I got a little Tacoma that does mm -hmm. okay, and my wife drives a diesel, and that thing sits in the driveway as much as possible. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. At five, what is it, 540 a gallon yeah, now? 540 today, I saw. Hey, my God. I, I mean, we made the bad choice of buying an expensive vehicle, but we can still complain about it. Yeah. I mean, we did. When we bought diesels, the fuel prices were lower. Yeah. And in theory, diesel is less expensive to make sure. and therefore should be more, more readily effect. available. Yep. And it's not. And I don't know who to blame for that. I wish I did, but I don't. Um, but that said, being an island uh, like we are in this area in the Quad Cities and not having available housing is going to create a challenge. It's a challenge for you and your wife today. It's going to be a challenge for new firefighters coming in. Hell, it's a challenge for the folks who help us out at Walmart or Fry's sure. to, to figure out how they can live here. And, and the reality is we, we need all of these people to make the community work. So there has to be something as far as an affordable housing option. And I know there are people actively working on it. The Fane family's one. Travis Bard's been working on it out in Chino Valley. Uh, the town of Chino Valley, Prescott Valley, CAFMA, we're all talking about what can we do. But as taxing entities or tax supported entities, we're limited. You're right. So how do we, again, it goes back to, okay, well, how do we recruit people? Because now recruitment's going to be out of the valley because that's where people can find, we'll call it quote unquote affordable living because even stories out of the valley are saying that people are being priced out of the market. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think it's just a, I don't think we're special in that case. I think every place is seeing the right. increase in the housing costs. Um, yeah, it, it's tough when people from certain states come and buy the same house they just sold for over a million dollars for half that amount and pay cash. Yeah. It's just, it's tough. So You can't compete. And that's where supply has to catch up with demand. And, and hopefully in the next couple of years, we'll see that happen and that'll drive some of the housing costs back down again and from a property tax perspective driving the, the housing cost back down isn't the greatest because our net assessed valuation doesn't go up as much sure on the other hand we're stuck in that limited value that can only go up five percent a year so in all existing properties we're only getting five percent we're nowhere near what the actual value of the home is today right double-edged sword right so it's 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 tricky when we look at this because i don't you weren't here during a time when uh, the, the agencies, when they were separate, went through wage freezes. Right. And, man, that was a tough time. And you, you can't ever make up the damage wage freezes do. Right. So everything we try to do right now is to focus on how do we pay a wage that's competitive, that can't compete with what costs are, and balance that with, hey, we can't get too carried away where 
in a year or two, we're going to be in, in a wage-free situation. If he had the answer, he wouldn't be talking about it. I know. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's, it's one of those things. It's not that easy. But that's, you know, that's where I think having an open and frank discussion with someone like yourself about, hey, here's the challenges. Because how often do you hear that information? Not very often. Right. And, and that's, that's on us. We need to get that information out and more readily available so that because you're someone that has the talent to promote through the ranks. And so at some point, this could be your problem right. to deal with. So if, if you have your eyes on that today, then you're going to be in a better position as you promote to understand how to navigate those situations. Sure. Right. But again, we, we have to recruit good people. We recruit based on character so that we have folks in line for those opportunities to promote. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's tough. Recruitment's going to be tough when, mm -hmm. um, like you said, it's going to be recruitment out of the valley. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we're off to a good start with the different recruitment videos and um, mm -hmm. Adam Wagner taking charge of the recruitment program and getting into the schools and stuff like that. I think we're off to a good start. Um, obviously, there's room to improve and, and do more things with that, but... I think just in the past few months, we've been making good strides. So, Well, and I need to get with Adam, and you're working with him as part of that as well, aren't you? Correct. So one of the things I want to do is get you guys on a field trip down to Chandler Fire Department because Chandler has an outstanding cadet program. And they said they, they didn't do well when they got into the colleges to recruit, but once they got into the high schools and they set up a cadet program, I think the minimum age is 16. Um it's become a feeder program for Chandler, Gilbert, and Mesa Okay. for good firefighters. And it's a, a program with a path for kids who may not know what they want to do. Sure. And it's a good opportunity. And the great thing is a lot of parents up here are concerned because they're, they're kids. They're, there aren't jobs for them. So if we can create a program that leads to a position where their kids can stay here, that's a win. Yeah, it's a game changer. Here's the loss. Um, they're never going to move out of your house. <laughs> because, so we're going to keep them here, and they won't move away, but they're not going to move away from you at all. Yeah. You're going to have to build a casita out back so they can afford it. But it, it bridges that gap, and if we can provide those opportunities. And, and tell me what you think of this, Josh. So today we all know we're struggling with um, just in the profession, getting EMTs and paramedics. So one of the things we're thinking about after talking to Abbott by College is we model a cadet program off of what Chandler has. And then we put something in place that says, if you meet this criteria between the time you start and the time you graduate high school, we will give you a scholarship into the EMT program. I think that'd be a good idea. Kind of gives them uh, an incentive to see that program out. And they kind of right. see the the end goal at it, um, and then you also get to keep you know keep eyes on them through the whole program and see who's going to be the best fit you know at the end of the road for the right. organization. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. And it, it's it's not all that expensive. Uh, when I spoke with you have a Pike College, they said about fifteen hundred for EMTs. Now, for you and I, we put ourselves through EMT school. Mm -hmm. I put myself through paramedic school. But back then, it was, hey, this this competitive job market. Right. If you want in, you're going to have to do these things. And, and people wanted to be EMTs and paramedics and firefighters. And then that was in the, the early 90s. Then after 2001, people were lined up to get in sure. to be firefighters. And today, it's crickets. I think I was, I was talking to... Uh, one of our union guys about this. Um, I think we're kind of getting into this new generation of firefighters who were, you know, born in the late nineties to early two mm thousands -hmm. that really don't have that emotional tie to nine 11. Right. Like I was only four or five. So I remember it, but I don't have that an emotional connection to it. Like, you know, you do or people who were in their late teens, early twenties when it happened. Thank you for that. So I think, <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, you know, there's something to say to that to where they just don't see, um, you know, the pride and the willing to serve after that happened. Right. They just don't have that connection to it. 
Well, and I, I think we're seeing that in a lot of areas in our communities where there's not the the willingness or the desire to serve. Right. You know, when you get into the fire service, there's, there's a couple things people should know. You've just entered into politics, which nobody likes, um, and you're not going to get rich. Yep. Welcome to the fire service. Yep. If you know that going in. Right. But I think there's something more to it. I know for me in my career, and I'd like to hear from you, that as as the years have gone on, I think back fondly to those those people and those calls where I really had the opportunity to make a difference in somebody's life. And and that means something to me. And in the position I'm in today, um, while I'm not responding to the 911 calls, I feel like I'm in a place where I can make a difference for the people that work here. I can make a difference for the communities that we serve. And that's rewarding. Yeah. And uh, from your perspective, how long have you been on now? Uh, two and a half years. Okay. From your perspective, what do you, what do you see? What are your thoughts regarding that? Um. For me, it's, I think the ones I take most satisfac- satisfaction in is, um, for the most part, public assists. Mm-hmm. Um, just for example, we had an older gentleman um, who's been having issues, been falling quite quite frequently um, out in Williamson Valley. Go there, pick him up, all's well and good. And just seeing the appreciation mm-hmm. that they have, um, you know, they don't want to bother us. They don't want to call us, but they have no other choice. Right. Um, so they're very appreciative of, of us. Um, and then if you sit and talk for five, 10 minutes afterwards, sometimes you hear some pretty good stories. Um, he used to play for the St. Louis Rams back in the seventies. Really? Um, I mean, just a beautiful house, pictures all over the wall and calls like that, that, you know, they hate to bother us, but it's not a bother at all. Right. Cause they're so appreciative of our service. Um, and just seeing that, I mean, I'll do that all day long. And it, it, it is amazing how many people do appreciate us and, and send us cards and letters and thank yous. Um, there are people who struggle sometimes with, with that. And I think it's, well, they can get a hold of us. We're local. Mm-hmm. And were you on the U Picket Fire? No. You, you weren't? No. So... We, we'll talk about this with Doug on a, another episode, but we had a gentleman call. He was very upset with us for not responding and, and putting the fire out. Mm. So we just let it burn for three days and we weren't there. Yeah. Pretty sure we were there for three days. I mean, our, our credit cards say we were there for three days. Mm-hmm. But there's more people in the community who care and who appreciate us than call in with those types of complaints. Exactly. And I think that's perspective that we need to keep. Mm-hmm. So in, in your mind, in the the time that we're in with the, with trying to find EMTs and paramedics and uh, future firefighters, what's your approach to drawing people to this profession? What, what would you say? You know, Chief, that's tough. I mean, mm-hmm. if we had the right answer, I think we'd already be implementing that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't think it's that black and white. Um, like I said, I think we're making great strides with the mm-hmm. recruitment program. Um, I'm not familiar with Chandler's cadet program, but that sounds like an interesting idea. It's something that's worth trying. We'll take um, a field trip. Yeah. No, that's that's awesome. Um, but like you said, you know, you're not going to get rich doing this job. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think after the pandemic, um, I like people. That. People are starting to see. They're starting to prioritize their life before their job. Right. Um, but then some some might go too far to the right and kind of expect to be paid to do nothing. Um, you know, they just want the check without the work. Right. So I think it's tough to, to be able to bridge that gap. Um, yeah, if there was a 100% right answer on how to fix this problem, that'd be great. But I was I hoping just you don't had think it. there is. Yeah, I'm not the right person to ask. Yeah, because <laughs> I, I don't have it. And... So that's why we're, we're looking for perspective yeah. from other people. I mean, you've been on the job for two and a half years, but you've worked in the field for longer than that. Right. And it sounds like your entry into fire and EMS was similar to mine in that I didn't have a life changing experience as a kid that led me to this. Um, I did a little volunteer work uh, when I got out of the military. And then when I got into air traffic control school, but then they shut the school down. So I couldn't go to air traffic control school. I had to find another profession. And 
my great grandfather had been a St. Louis City firefighter for his career for thirty something years, and so my grandfather called St. Louis City and they called back and they said, "Tell him not to come work here. Uh, go get his paramedic, and then look for a fire job somewhere else." And my question was, "What's a paramedic? <laughs> what what does that do?" Yeah, and so I ended up in EMT school and paramedic school, and I really found a passion for what we do that I didn't know existed because right. I, I, I hadn't been exposed to it. And I think that's part of that cadet program is exposing younger folks at the high school level. Right. Um, and, and for parents, we're not trying to dissuade them from college. We're just giving them another avenue. Right. And and I think that's important for kids to have because we're, we are seeing more um, people leaning towards the trades again yeah. than the college side because when you go through some of the trade schools and you come out and you're making as much or more than some of the people that are coming out with their master's. Yeah. Uh, with no, little to no student debt. Right. Yeah. And I have a master's degree. Uh, I just received notice that my payment was taken again. So I'm still paying my should've, student loan debt. Should have canceled your credit card. <laughs> I know. Um, so we, we advocate for higher education in the fire service, but we also support that with what we provide as far as benefits and um, reimbursement. Right. Up, up to 80%. And we just increased it on the undergraduate side and graduate side. Right. So it, makes it a little bit easier for someone to go to school yep. to get their higher education so they can promote. So it's not that we're not promoting higher education, but for me, um, I started after high school, wasn't kind of like you, wasn't what I needed, went a different direction, got into the emergency services, and then found a direction for college because I found a purpose right. for what I was going to school for. And it wasn't fire service related. But they were things that did relate directly back to being in the fire service, being in this uh, this job in this field that were applicable. Right. Yeah, I think you said it perfectly, Chief. Um, I mean, you didn't know anything about it until you got exposed to it, mm -hmm. and then the passion grew after that. And I think that's that's something we have to put out there is getting um, these younger kids exposed mm -hmm. um, and seeing if it you know, turns on any passion for the job. Mm -hmm. um, without that, I mean, most people just don't know what a firefighter does. Let me ask you this, uh, because at the fire chief level, we had, we've had some conversation about, have we done such a good job of promoting the need to protect firefighters because of cancer, because of behavioral health concerns, PTSD? Um, have we done such a good job promoting those things so that we get coverage that, other people now look at this profession and say, what? You, you have to have presumptive cancer laws because you're this many times more likely in this profession to be diagnosed with cancer than the public. Yeah. I, I mean, it's tough to, it's tough to say on that. Right. Um, I mean, nobody wants to see anybody get cancer or mm -hmm. have any mental health issues, but that's, there's no other way to say it than it's part of the job. Mm -hmm. um, there's safety we can take into effect. There's um, different precautions we can take, like you said, but at the end of the day, it's still a risk and it's always going to be a risk. And I think that's the key is, is recognizing the risk mm -hmm. and mitigating it to the best of our ability. Right. Uh, we are actually seeking an assistance of firefighters grants uh, this year, mm -hmm. trying to get cancer screening for every one of our employees to set a baseline. And maybe during those screenings, you, you got to figure if we're putting that many people through, we're going to find something. Right. Not we, not me because it's HIPAA. So no, yeah. it, but if we do, hopefully we found it in such an early stage that we can fix it. Right. In addition to that, we've implemented uh, protocols, SOGs, policies on SCBAs, on um, turnout gear cleaning. And we're buying new particulate hoods for everybody, two per person. That's 
$34,000 for yeah. hoods. Yeah. Those particular hoods are, you know, I've seen some studies. We actually had some when I worked at the Grand Canyon um, and just the difference in protection that you have mm -hmm. with the standard Nomex is, is huge. I mean, it's expensive, but um, I think it's kind of a, a necessary expense to, mm -hmm. you know, take care of our guys and our guys and girls. So, well, and, and here's the other part of that. And this is where, um, if your wife hasn't been, we definitely want her to come to the Partners Academy next year mm -hmm. because that's where we really try to sway them to our side. Right. Uh, and what I mean by that is we provide the necessary equipment to decon after a fire gear, which will take 85% of the carcinogens off the gear before you ever take a mask off. I'm not going to ask you to answer this question, but the question I posed to the partners this year was, how many crews do you think are actually following through with the basic bucket, brush, and soap, we always carry water, that we put on the engines, and they're properly deconning before they take their turnout gear off and put it back on the engine? Uh, I'm not asking you the question. I think we both know the answer. I think we both do. <laughs> That's where we try to get to the significant others to say, hey, look, there's a way to help prevent this, mm -hmm. but we need you to help guide them. Right. To, I expect you to live throughout the, your career. I expect you to go in retirement and still be here for me. Mm -hmm. And so buckle down and do what you're supposed to do to protect yourself. Yep. I think if it came from her, it'd be a little bit more scary. <laughs> I, I think it would. That's why we're doing yep. this at the Partners Academy. Yep. That's why we're promoting That's that. That's a good idea. We want to get... When we get the significant others involved, more stuff gets done. Yeah. Uh, Who would have thought? I know. I know. It, it works somehow. Something so simple, too. Yeah. So, I, you know, in that vein, like you said, we are doing a lot to try to mitigate those risks. But some of that is on the, on the person. Right. The individual. But, it, it, you know, if we look at the military side, look how many people continue to go in the military even though they were deployed for years in Afghanistan and Iraq. Mm -hmm. um, so... I don't, I don't know that we have um, promoted ourselves out of a profession by really exposing the idea that, hey, we, we have th these risks. Here's the steps we can take to mitigate. Right. Yeah, I would agree with you. I mean, it, it's probably scared a few people out mm -hmm. of joining this profession, but um, I think the people with the passion for it mm – -hmm. Um, they're going to look past that, accept the risks, and do what they can to lower them or mitigate them. Well, and I, th I think if we can get out and, and look at a cadet program and, and do some of the things that you are doing along with Adam Wagner and others, I think it's important because it, it, it always amazes me. We understand how the fire department works, the structure of the fire department, the rank, but I'll talk to people in the community and they're like, oh, you're the captain of the fire department. Well, kind of. Yeah. I'm, I'm the fire chief. What does that do? Right. I don't do anything. <laughs> I just have a title. Yeah. Um, so there's not a lot of understanding. And, and I say that to say, if we want to attract people to this profession, we have to educate them on what it is. Right. And I think if we have ambassadors like yourself, I think that's going to go a long way to attracting people into this. But if we, if we start a cadet program, we have to have the people committed to see it through. Right. Because we can't bring these young people in and then not provide the actual program for them. Right. So that's going to be the key. Yeah. I don't think it'll be an overnight thing, but... No. It's going to take some work, but I think it's a good idea. We'll go on a field trip. We'll ask Chief Dwiggins Chandler to buy us lunch. Sounds good to I me. I like that idea. Free lunch? Yeah. All Tom, right. we're coming yeah. down. I'll take it. So... Um, it. If you could, if you could say something to younger people looking at this profession, um, just give them a, a, a couple of words as to why this would be the right profession for someone to choose, and then if you're okay with it, what are a couple of things you would say as to why someone would want want to come work for CAFMA? Oh man, put me on the spot. I am. Um, That's what I do. I mean, this job in a whole is. 
for me, the biggest thing is you never know what the day is going to bring you. Every day is different, no matter what. You're never going to run on the same call. Mm-hmm. Um, you're never going to have the same turnout of the day. You might not even have the same crew each shift. Um, so for me, that it just keeps things in- interesting, keeps me refreshed and engaged. Um, as far as working for CAFMA, um, for me, family is huge. And this is just a very family-oriented department. Um, and it, I mean, you guys don't just say it. It's proven in the actions. Um, I know I wasn't here, but when Patty was going through um, what she was going through a few mm-hmm. years ago, um, just seeing the support from everybody, you know, it's not just a coworker. Oh, sorry, here's a get well soon card. It's overwhelming support for whoever needs it. Absolutely. Um, so for me, that's that's the number one thing of why I love working here. Well, I, and that comes from everybody because we can say it, but if you don't do it in the station, right, um, or they don't do it in the warehouse or fleet, then it it's not really part of the culture. So exactly. Um, you know, a big thank you to you and and the folks that you're working with out in the field, and to Jonah and, and his folks because without you actually embracing that idea. Um, it doesn't work. Exactly. It, it does just become words. And hopefully other people will see that and be attracted to work here as we go forward. You know, obviously we continue to work on pay and benefits and those types of things while hiring additional people. And I would say there's going to be a lot of opportunity in the coming years um, because we're going to have to grow to meet demand. Yeah. And so we're going to be looking for people and we want good people. We're not just filling seats we're not yeah. looking for warm bodies. You have to sit with these people for 24 hours. Yep. And can you do that? That's so, the biggest thing. And and that's why you all get to do some of the interviews. Yeah. To, to say, yes, this person I can work with. But Josh, thank you for coming in. I thank you, really Chief. appreciate it. I appreciate you being on here. Any closing thoughts, words, anything you'd like to say? No, I think we, we hit everything. You want to say happy anniversary or anything? Yeah, happy anniversary. I love you. Go. you. <laughs> See, little, little early, but you're yep. you're out there to the world. Yeah. Now she can't that. say I forgot it. No, because you so hit it early, good. so you're good. Yep, you're all set. All right. Well, Josh, again, thanks, Jonah. Thank you for this, thank and you. for all of you out there watching, please hit like and subscribe. Continue to listen or tune in, and until next week, we're gonna go out and do what we do. Well, you are. I'm just gonna sit in an office. Yep.